Welcome back to the Save It For Parts channel. Today we're taking a look at another old satellite telephone from the 90s. Now it may seem odd to call a satellite phone old, but these things have been around for a while. They just haven't been affordable for the general public. Usually you have to be a millionaire or an oil company or military contractor to even get your hands on a satellite phone. But these days they are becoming much more common. Companies like Starlink are teaming up with terrestrial cell phone companies to offer this technology to the world in general. So you no longer have to own your own private jet to also own a satellite phone. Now that also means that the old school satellite phones like this one are becoming obsolete and showing up cheap or even free on the used market. This one looks a bit like a laptop, not just in the case here, but the contents actually look like a laptop as well. We've got this clamshell unit that, this looks like a 90s laptop, but it's not. It is actually the antenna. We have the phone handset, which looks like a standard 90s cell phone. And we've got a big beefy battery charger. This unit was sent to me by Luke from the Nervous Mechanic YouTube channel, so everyone should go over and check him out. I will throw a link to his channel down below, and then I'll probably have a link up here as well. Thank you for thinking of me, Luke. I don't know what I'm gonna do with this, but we'll see if we can open it up and investigate it a little bit more. So the hardware is a Mitsubishi OmniQuest, specifically a model ST251, and this is kind of a third-party satellite telephone network. You may have heard of Iridium and Inmar Sat. They're kind of the big name satellite phone companies that have stuck around from the 90s to this day with a few bankruptcies along the way. This used a system called IMSAT, which was set up by AMSC Corporation in the 90s. Now that company has also gone through a few bankruptcies, reorganizations. I believe they were called Light Squared for a while, and now they're owned by a company called Legato. I don't know if these satellites are actually still operational. Apparently they've gone through a few of them. Apparently they started with MSAT-1 in 1995. They launched another satellite, AMSC-1, in 1996, but that suffered some amplifier failures, so the company switched back to the older satellite for a while. Then in 2010, they launched SkyTerra-1, and this one actually was written off as an insurance claim about two years ago, although some websites say it's still in operation, so I don't actually know if any of this equipment still works, if there is a working satellite for it to connect to, and if that SkyTerra system still works, I don't know if this equipment is able to talk to it, if it still uses the same technology, the same frequencies. This stuff uses the L-band around 1500 megahertz, and apparently there was some controversy with that. From what I've been able to find, the company had to reduce the frequency range they were using because they were interfering or potentially interfering with GPS systems, which are also around 1500 megahertz. We have an external antenna connection. It's actually just, it looks like it's connected internally to the lid. We have a data port, this 25 pin, probably a serial port, although it looks more like a parallel port. We have this J box, uh, junction box, I assume. And then we have this HS, I'm assuming that's the handset. Yeah, that looks like just a phone jack to go out to this guy. There's a funky power connector on the side, and this big heavy unit supplies not just the power to the box, but is also the battery charger, so it's kind of an all-in-one external charger and power brick. And the battery here just slides into the laptop-looking unit, just like a laptop battery. The battery cover is slightly damaged, it keeps falling off. I'm going to try not to bump that too much. There was some additional paperwork in the case. Uh, we've got kind of a general overview here, some kind of FCC certificate, and then our main and very 90s instruction manual. Yeah, copyright 1997. I think this qualifies as a vintage antique collectible now. Now this is kind of interesting. There are two little knobs here with uh, L, U, L, and R. It looks like lock, unlock, and remove. And I think that the side of this will actually pop out, so you don't actually have to take any screws out to open this up. That's pretty unique. Usually companies that make equipment like this don't want you to get in there. And yeah, there we go. Um, this sucker just pops out and this has some pretty crazy connectors on it. We've got this uh, I think 15 pin connector and then this wacky 14 pin plus RF connector. This looks like something really proprietary. This says it is the transceiver unit. The other module in here I think is called the RF unit, and that looks like it is probably the actual uh, transmitter receiver. That's probably the actual radio hardware, and then the antenna here, because this has, again, it has the antenna jack 
inside that central unit that goes up to the lid. So if this is the radio, then what the heck is this guy? It's probably some kind of little computer that handles the authentication, handles the network connection, um, basically logs into the satellite. This might have something like what a modern SIM card would have in it. It would have a serial number that the satellite knows about. Um, maybe it would have some kind of encryption keys. Not 100% sure, and I don't know if this is going to be super useful for me. I think this is a fairly standard-ish antenna connector. I might have some adapters to talk to that, so I might be able to look at the antenna here on uh, a Nano VNA or something. And I think there were some dish antennas that you could connect to this as an accessory, so if you didn't like how your little flat panel antenna worked, you could connect it to something bigger. Again, the actual handset is fairly boring. This probably is an off-the-shelf handset that worked with cell phones of the era as well. And um, yeah, it's just kind of like an RJ45 jack here. Apparently there is another accessory that's like a push-to-talk uh, feature, so you could use this kind of like a uh, like a Nextel phone, if anybody remembers those. And the handset here clips into the side of the main antenna unit if you want it to be all one thing. I'm really curious if this actually still works. It's a little mysterious whether or not this will connect to anything, and there's no information that I can find about how to actually get an account with a phone like this. Now, maybe that isn't so mysterious. It was built in the 90s when only millionaires could afford it. And millionaires have people to figure out all the peasant details, like getting accounts. I think that's kind of carried over to today. You get these multi-million dollar satellite phone companies with kind of no information on their websites, because if you're rich enough to afford their service, you're not going to use their website. And the whole thing might be obsolete anyway. That latest satellite was launched in 2010. It had a 15-year design life, so it's basically at the end of its life, and it's already started failing according to that insurance claim a couple years ago. So, yeah, who knows if the satellite even works anymore. I guess there's only one way to find out is to turn this on and see if anything happens with it. All right, so we have no service currently, and we have this other mysterious message. I'll have to consult the manual and see what this means. Okay, this wants me to uh, confirm what beam we're looking at, what uh, spot beam we're trying to detect from which satellite. So referring to the little card here, I would be in beam two. All right, well, beam one seems to be working better. And again, this has switched satellites several times since 1997, so, I'm just going to tell it that's okay. I think it's searching at this point. It looks like it's incrementing through the beams. Yeah, jumped back to that first screen. It didn't like my selection of beam one. I'm digging into the manual here, and I really enjoy this page. Um, they note that a couple of these features are for dealers only, and uh, we should never use these as a user. And if you do use it, you could break it, and, and that mistake, in quotes, is not covered by the warranty. So. Don't make mistakes. This refuses to use beam one. I'm gonna try manual beam selection. I tried this thing outside. It would only ever get about a 45 signal out of a possible 80. So no signal, it would not get a lock, would not uh, tell me there was a network. And any time that I tried to connect, it would just sit there searching through the different bands. I suspect there just isn't a service that supports this old hardware anymore. Again, this is from 1997. The satellite that supported this guy only had a thousand channels. So it could only handle a thousand of these units active at once in North America. That's still probably not profitable enough to launch a new satellite. They would need something with new hardware that could do frequency hopping, spread spectrum stuff, all that modern nonsense. I did see some stuff in the manual about commissioning, uh, setting up the satellite terminal to talk to the satellite, and that is mostly dealer stuff. So I don't know the right codes and the right frequencies to use for that. I'm not going to mess with that. Um, I did find out from the manual that that transceiver unit that I popped out earlier, yeah, you can take that whole unit and plug it into another radio system, as, and that basically brings your account along with you, authorizes you on a different satellite terminal. So yeah, that giant thing that pops out of the side is essentially the SIM card. Also, I just realized that battery door is missing again. I think that fell off outside. I found some more information on this in a Mitsubishi technical publication, and I was wrong about exactly what the transceiver and the RF unit do. I actually found a diagram in there. So the transceiver unit does have the transmitter and receiver. The RF unit just has the amplifiers and the diplexer. So there is a uplink power amplifier for transmitting, and there's a downlink low noise amplifier in there for receiving. And that's all stuff that might be useful with other equipment if I can find 
or harvest that weird connector plug with the two antenna adapters inside of it. And I did find someone online who has done a more detailed teardown of one of these. I'll put a link to their website down below. Now, I'm interested in what the antenna will do. I would like to open this up and see what is this panel antenna? Is it some kind of phased array? Is it just a giant patch antenna? I'm going to throw it on my little uh, Nano VNA SA2 antenna analyzer. And I did have to dig out an adapter. So this antenna uses SMB, which is uh, this guy over here, or this end. And my antenna analyzer and everything else uses SMA, which is this. So, so the SWR in this antenna is optimized for the L band, as you'd expect, around 1500 to 1680 megahertz. That's made me a little curious if the antenna would work for some other L band satellites that I look at. All right, we've got our redneck or improvised L band antenna here. I'm just using the phone with STR on the RTL SDR. We have the Sawbird goes to uh, amplify the L-band signal, and then we're just hooked up to the panel antenna. I left the rest of the unit on here. Um, if I did this uh, long term, if I want to actually use this antenna, I'd probably separate the antenna part from the RF part because it's much lighter. And yeah, I think a small rotor or small azimuth elevation system would uh, work with this pretty well. But for now, I'm just going to hand aim it, even though I'm really bad at that, and we're going to see if we can get anything. Uh, Russian Meteor M23 should be coming over momentarily. Uh, kind of that track. Well, this thing got a better signal than I thought, and for much more of the satellite pass than I thought. So we'll get this processed and see if we got an image from it. Okay, that last pass with Meteor M23 was kind of garbage. Uh, we didn't really get anything out of it, and I don't know if that's because the antenna or because it was a relatively low pass. It was only about 40 degrees. So we have an 80 degree pass coming up, going right overhead, also with Meteor M23. Well, let's give that a try. And then immediately after that, we have NOAA 19 coming over, so we'll try that as well. All right, we did actually get some data that time. So that antenna does work for L-band low Earth orbit satellites. It's not ideal, but my hand tracking is also not ideal. So I think if we stuck that on a rotor, it'd be a little bit better. Now we've got NOAA 19 coming up in a moment. So let's see what we get from that. So here's what we got from NOAA 19 and it's recognizable, but it's not great. There's a lot of interference. It's not a fantastic signal. There's some weird distortion. That... So I just realized there are screws holding this antenna together. They were under these little covers. So. I think we can actually open this up and see what the antenna looks like. All right, so that is our antenna. It's got two pieces with this foam separator uh, between them. So yeah, it just uh, goes up to these two kind of patches, I guess. That's really interesting. I don't know what you would call something like this. I did have a vague idea for this that I could take the antenna off, slap it on the back of a tablet PC, and just use the whole thing as the thinnest and lightest HRPT L-band receiver. Just aim the whole thing up at passing HRPT satellites. But the antenna, unfortunately, is not fantastic for that. So um, we'll put this away and maybe we'll come up with another use for it in the future. If anybody out there has any ideas for this, uh, please let me know in the comments. If you have any ideas for using the antenna or hacking into the built-in LNA in the satellite phone, or if you know anything about activating this thing, if that IMSAT system, that AMSC, or whatever they're called today, if that satellite system is still around and I could still use this phone, that could be an entertaining novelty for a minute or two. Thank you again to Luke with the Nervous Mechanic channel for sending me this. Again, I will link to him down below and you guys should go check him out. Finally, thank you to everyone for watching and we'll see you next time.